red spot over my right shoulder here, right there, that's what you see behind Chuck. It's one of those. Oh. But in M33. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> NGC 604 or something like that? I don't know the NGC number, but I I know it's M33. And and, and that uh, that nebula is much oh. bigger. I, I meant the actual nebula. It has oh, a separate nebula, NGC. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. Isn't that Orion behind you? It's yeah. behind Chuck, yeah. The Orion Nebula. And that, yeah, and I'm, you just, took... I'm just saying it's one of those. It's not that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we'll have Mr. Tom join us, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but are we going on YouTube Live too? We're live. Time? We're live right now, actually. So it's time to start, I think. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Pictures both from NASA's Perseverance on Mars and a picture of Percy from high above in an orbiter we'll talk about maybe. We're going to find out this hour what an asterism is. I learned, and you will too. A look at the night sky for the coming week mm -hmm. and the variable star of the month. Welcome aboard, everybody. It's the second installment, season number one, episode two of our weekly Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit podcast which members of the South Coast Longtime Telescope and Astronomy Club, the SBAU is going to present every Monday morning, roughly around 11 a.m., which it is now, on Zoom. Stand by, folks, for a full hour of cutting-edge space developments, new scientific discoveries, some astrophysics thrown in, and SBAU Club News. Mm -hmm. My name is Baron Ron Heron. Proudly, I hosted a similar show with these guys on radio for several years, Program can be seen on YouTube. In fact, it may be live right now. Oh, there's Mr. Winterborn joining us. Hi. We're gonna, how you doing, Tom? Fine, fine. Just making soup. <laughs> <laughs> and we got some sourdough bread out of the oven to dip into it. Let me introduce the gang from our board, and I call them the uh, the, the Brain Trust. President Jerry Wilson, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, we have our outreach coordinator, Chuck McPartland. Chuck. Good morning. You actually had a virtual outreach recently we're going to talk about. Okay. Involving Javier and others. Our incredibly talented webmaster and distinguished technician, Tom Totten, up there in the upper left corner, former Westmont College <laughs> science instructor, editor of our newsletter, and a damn good sourdough bread baker, Tom Whittemore. Welcome <laughs> aboard, you. everybody. We've got so much to talk about. I don't know where to begin. I read a few of these things. President Jerry, would you like to kick us off? What's on your mind right now? Oh, um, let's see. The uh, challenge of the week here is that you can find, if you have a larger scope, um, among, but amateur scopes, not professional scopes, you can find, these are, these are from the items of the week from Astronomy Magazine. Right. And, uh, Pluto. You can find Pluto. Ah, it's um, in Sagittarius, Eastern Sagittarius, um, about twelve and a half degrees west of Saturn. So, assuming you can find Saturn, which is not that hard to find, um, it's it, early in the morning, huh, Jerry? In the morning, yes, yes. It's in the morning so, sky. Can you see my uh, Stellarium uh, screen? Uh huh. Yes. You can see the sun is rising over there. Venus is ahead of the sun and then i think we have jupiter saturn what, who do we have coming up mercury, there we have, probably oh yeah mercury uh jupiter then saturn and then the, the moon and then pluto the tail end of sagittarius's horse it looks like so let's see it's going to be tough with the dawn light and the moon and being magnitude 14. Right. oops well, I, I was going to say i only saw pluto one time in my life and it's in a 61 inch in tucson uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little larger scope than you need, but it will yeah. certainly do the job. <laughs> oh, there! Show, can we see the moons around Pluto? No. no. <laughs> you can from the New Horizons images. Is that right? Yeah. So <laughs> pair of binoculars won't be able to see Pluto. Okay. All right. Did uh, Tom Whittemore? Did you just get an email I sent you? Uh, I haven't seen it yet, Jerry. What'd you say? Oh, no, it's it's the talking points for today. Oh, I did get that, yeah. Just now? Uh, I, I think you sent them earlier, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah I saw them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what I can contribute today. I, I just have been reading this book, Extraterrestrial, by Avi Loeb. It's, it's pretty fascinating stuff. 
Oh, that's uh, right. He's the one that is at uh, what MIT or Harvard? Uh, Harvard. 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 He's not the chairman anymore, but he's at Harvard. And he's and the one that, he's, he's the one that thinks that uh, Umuamua was a uh, mm. uh, like a sail craft. Possibly was a <laughs> rocket ship. Was a solar sail interstellar probe. Maybe yeah. it's one of maybe it's one of Elon Musk's SpaceX. He owns everything else. So his, his large boosters have blown up so much that there may be pieces flying by like that. Yeah. That's, called, that's called the uh, the Starship, yeah. right? And it's in the middle of Texas. It's got to be way hundreds of miles from any settlement, wouldn't you think? The way they keep I think crashing. it's along the coast, along yeah. the Texas coast. Oh, it is. Yeah. He's well, going to not... eventually launch those things from ocean um, um, platforms. Yeah. And uh, that's good because in another couple of decades, where he's at right now, will be underwater. Well, <laughs> the, the Starship, uh, if you've seen it, actually looks like some of the rockets we grew up looking at. They had yeah, fins the, on them. The 30, and they're tapered yeah. at, like the one at Disneyland. Yeah, Flash Gordon is resurrected. Because I always wondered, you know, there's nothing on the, that rocket ship. It's just a tall candle and it's lit at the bottom and there's no fins and it somehow gets into space. When, well, you know, why wouldn't they wear the. Let's, let's look at the rest of the week here. Uh, variable star of the month is actually a double, right, Mr. President? Yes, it is. It's uh, one of the stars of um, Cassio of uh, Gemini. Chuck, do you want us Gemini? to make comments about that? Uh, Castor and Pollux are up there. They're part of the, uh, the winter circle of, of bright stars around Betelgeuse uh, that I think gets talked about farther down, although it's, it's made in terms of a hexagon or heptagon. I just think of it as a circle. And uh, it's one of the heads of, of the Gemini twins, Castor and Pollux. And uh, it's a multiple star. It's not just a binary. It's, I think, four stars. Really? Yeah. But they, they don't name all four stars. The whole unit together, all four of them becomes which one? Castor? Castor which you see with your naked eye. Because they're oh, yeah. named after naked eye. They're named by up, people just with their eyes. Tom, could you put up the picture that I have in the notes? Yeah, I'll do that in just a sec. OK. OK. And share screen. Where's our notes? This should be it. Yeah, and if, you, <laughs> if you're trying to distinguish uh, Castor from uh, Pollux, I mean Castor and uh, and Pollux, Castor yep. is closer to Capella, and Pollux is closer to Procyon. So, but they're they're both uh, binary or trinary. Well, Castor is. Yeah. Right. Castor, okay. Castor is also more blue. And Pollux is more yellow look. Yeah. And but, you can see that in this picture. Pollux is more yellow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But my understanding is that more than half the stars in the sky are multiples. Is yeah. that correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, Pollux just happens to be a single, but Castor is several, three yeah. or four. And they're all named the same. They're all Castor. We, don't, we can't see them apart in your telescope. Unless, unless you have a telescope. Oh, only a telescope shows it. Did they ever eclipse each other? And so it becomes like double bright ones behind oh, the other. These are not in the plane to eclipse each other. Oh, OK. Yeah. They're not tilted right. And you, you call it a variable star or you, the magazine you got this from astronomy or sky and telescope calls it astronomy variable because magazine, what? Magazine. I'm sorry. What? Astronomy magazine. OK, but you said variable star of the month. It's in Gemini, which is a constellation. Right. And um, it's after sunset, and yeah. uh, the twins is Gemini, right? Yeah. Kind of the top of the sky now, I think, right, Chuck? After sun goes down? It's pretty high up, yes. Yeah. 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 So I had, the, I had the counterbalance the previous thing, which was a morning event with something that mm -hmm. I'm more likely to do, which is an evening event. Okay. So. My uh, thinking about, I'm trying to remember what, the constellation looks like a Gemini. I know it's on the zodiac. It's twin mm -hmm. what? Twins, it's not twin stars. Twin people. Twin yeah. people. Twin Pollux. I see. I'm going to take my phone. An out interesting and story of, about Gemini was um, you know, sailors would navigate by these major stars, okay? And in Gemini, the English used to say they would navigate by Gemini. So the phrase by Gemini actually comes from that. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, cool. Very interesting. Uh, Tom, could you put that picture back up of uh, what you Here have? it is. I see no, the twins. No, no the uh, picture <laughs> of the star chart that I have. Uh, I mean, I have it here on Stellarium, right? You can see it here. No, 
I, uh, need, I need the, the other picture. Yeah, yeah, Jerry, it's quite right. detailed. It's quite detailed, Jerry's. Yeah. Well, how about asteroid Vesta? It continues well, to delight into more, Leo. We haven't we haven't concluded the variable star thing. <laughs> well, actually, it's okay. There it is. You see down. Um, let's see where is new. Mm -hmm. That's mu. New is for the, there. New, yeah, new. Right there. That's the variable star, Propus. Right there. It was discovered in 1865. It's a 234 thirty four day variable, and it only swings between magnitude 3.3 and 3.9. Wow. So mm. someone was looking at that for a long time and making detailed comparisons before they identified it as the uh, as the variable. Anyway, that's the variable of the month according to Astronomy Magazine. Hey, yes, Ron, Vesta. Yes, Ron. I did a quick look, and yeah. Pollux is indeed a, a binary. Oh, it is not visual. Okay, but now, is it only one of the the several or the two or however that goes up and down fluctuates that makes it a Cepheid no. variable? Or no, do they no, both? Ron. The variable is down in the feet of, of Gemini. Right. Not down one of the toes. heads like Castor and Pollux. So we're not talking about Castor anymore. We've moved on to to his feet. His okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, but there they are. They're not Messiers, right? They're not M's. No. They're no. Not. Okay. I was wondering. Messier didn't get it. There, what? What is the M thirty five? Is it called the shoe buckle nebula or something? Is that what they yeah. call that? Yeah, it looks like a soccer ball getting ready to be kicked. <laughs> <laughs> what does that big line uh, represent on the sky? Is that just connecting them? That's not a uh, constellation, is it? The line that just guides your eye to the asterism that is Gemini. Oh, I see. Okay. A pattern in the sky. The other <laughs> square line up at the top, that's the official boundary of that constellation. Right. And Direct it just it happens, it happens to be on the ecliptic, the, thus the zodiac. Yes. Not over, yes. Not overhead. Yeah. It's too long ago that I learned that. Okay, can we go forward, gentlemen? Uh, yeah, I, I just want to mention too, a caster is a double star, right? Where Pollux is actually a binary. Is that? Well, Pollux is a binary. Caster is a multiple. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. They call it a double star in in the uh, on Stellarium. So. Yeah, it's got like four components. Yeah, interesting. So some of them are some of them are probably true orbital, and some of them are probably just chance alignment. Mm -hmm. Okay, this will be the variable stars of the month. That'll be a regular feature, Mr. President, you suppose? <laughs> I, I, I can do that if you want. Uh, yeah. That's so <laughs> Shall we do an asteroid of the month? Sure. <laughs> Vesta, you said, continues to delight. I imagine it's as easy to find and see as the Pluto. Yeah. It's much it's easier. Passing by one of my favorite uh, asterisms, which is actually a collection of three galaxies. <laughs> and uh, they're referred to as M65, M66, and the cheeseburger. Well, speaking of the M's, uh, is there such a thing as a yearly uh, 2021 Messier Marathon? And that's coming up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Tell us about that. What does that mean? Something you can't do the other days of the year, right? Well, you can try it but um, your chances of succeeding are very low. Okay, you got to count all the M's in the sky? Uh, this no, they've been, been counted. The, the trick is that you've got to, it's a, it's a sort of a strategic planning event. Yeah. And you um, have to see, visually see all of the 110 Messier objects in one right. night. And so some of them you're going to get just as they're setting in the early evening, and then you're going to get other ones just as they're rising in the early morning. Right. So there's Those are galaxies, too, Jerry. That? Those are galaxies at the uh, end of the day. Yeah. And so the, there's a challenge to see them. If you do them, yeah. wrong, waste your time in the wrong order, then some of them have set before, you know, before you can get to them. And then so you, coast through, you coast through Virgo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is what Tom has put up is a list in order that you can try to observe them as they rise yeah. and set. And some well, of the early, depending on whether you do it earlier in March or later toward April, the um, 
the, the early evening ones get tougher and the morning ones get easier as you, as yeah. you go toward later dates. Can, can you describe the history to me? We're talking 1800s, a French astronomer named Messier. Charles Messier. Charles, Charles Messier just picked some big outlandishly uh, no, he, right. He, this was at a time in the past. Oops, we lost sound. Sound on oh, Jerry. So, so he was so he was working for the they French. They get noticed and they get patronized. He was working for the French government. Uh, you can't hear me? Now I hear you. Oh, I can hear you. I can hear you. Messier was working for the French government, uh, noting the positions of stars to use for navigation. But he would occasionally do fuzzy things. And in those times, you got famous by discovering comets. So oh. comets were fuzzy things. So he would note these things down. But if they stayed in the same place, he knew they weren't comets. Because comets orbit the sun, so they move. Right. And so he would note these things down uh, if they were fuzzy and could potentially be a comet, but weren't. They were like his garbage lists, things to, to <laughs> ignore in the future. <laughs> but he also heard about Herschel in England, who was making a catalog of all kinds of objects. And he figured, OK, well, if I make a big enough catalog, I can get inducted into the French Academy of Sciences. So he started to add some other things that were obviously not cometary, like the Pleiades star cluster, and the beehive star cluster. So he padded his list a little, but it worked. He got, he got elected to the French Academy of Sciences. And, and today, his, his, his initial list wasn't quite as long, but today it's been expanded from looking at his writings to 110 objects. And they're like an Audubon birders list for amateur astronomers because they're all visible in small scopes. He only had a three inch scope. Oh, so it's, it's a potpourri of everything from nebula, to bright stars, uh, total galaxies. That yes. Sure Andromeda is one. Yes. The thing that was a faint fuzzy in his telescope. Okay. It's got one object that just seems to be a double star. Yeah. Um, but for yeah. some reason, he thought it looked fuzzy. Maybe somebody next door had their chimney, you know, belching smoke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe there was a bug on his lens that spread yeah. it out, spread the light out. Wonder how many Messier objects is in Orion alone? Betelgeuse is probably one, right? No, no it, it, it just isn't. Yeah, Betelgeuse is stars. Okay. But Orion is M42. M42, 43. 43 and 78. You can 78. See well, now, why Wednesday? Why not any day of the year? Well, this last, this officially lasts over um, the weekend of March 13 to 14. And that's when, um, uh, what's this place? I've forgotten the name of it, Unistellar or something is hosting it. Oh. It's been going on for way longer than this. It's been going on since I got into amateur astronomy, which is back in the 60s. And but so it, this is the beginning of the season, Ron. So, yeah. so it has to be in March or early April, and you pick the weekend closest to new moon. And in this case, the new moon is actually on the weekend. Um, but but in midweek is, is when they become, uh, and it's probably been a, several days actually since they've become theoretically possible to do. But Unistellar is this company that makes an automated telescope and they're sort of hosting an, an event with their telescopes. Yeah, it's considered kind of a dirty pool, but a lot of people now with computer, computerized telescopes, you can just set your telescope to go automatically to these things. And you ensure that you can get to all of them, but um, it's much more challenging if you move the scope by hand to find them. Do star hopping, as it's called. You also need to be real high up in the uh, good, good good horizons on a mountain top or somewhere like that. Would it be fair to say that in the southern hemisphere, fear there are no messiers because he couldn't see there, so they're all up here with us, right? Well, you he can see. We can see into the southern hemisphere, Ron. We just can't see anything within 34 and a half degrees of the South Pole. Okay. So some of them are south of the equator, so technically in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. But now Messier was in France. Europe, I think, is a little further north than we are here, aren't they? Right, right. So yes. he's probably limited to 40 degrees or something. Yeah. Yes. I see. Right. It depends how far south you are if you're trying to see all the northern M's. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you can't see some of the far northern ones probably that he has. So mm -hmm. your Messier right. marathon would look a little different. Does anybody in the club ever count them? Oh, yeah. We used yeah. to have regular Messier marathons up on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Listen, as long as 
we got you on the screen uh, talking to us, Chuck. Tell us real quickly about our recent, um, I wanted to promote this, that we are available for online virtual outreach. You had one and featuring Javier, our connection to the Museum of Natural History recently. Well, Javier's retired now from the museum, but we Javier had a scope set up and Tom Totten here, our webmaster, was doing um, Stellarium like he's doing for us now. And uh, both Javier and I had scopes with uh, digital camera eyepieces inserted. And uh, we were connecting via Zoom with the Ventura Charter School. And so we were showing them various highlights of the nighttime sky. Hmm. Talking about the Pleiades, all the different yeah. uh, myths and legends and uses of the Pleiades in the past. And, and it was really cool that Chuck passed us back uh, thank you notes from the school and uh, here's, here's one. It says, thank you for teaching us about the stars. I really enjoyed learning about how to calculate the distance in space because thinking about it at first may seem easy, but it isn't actually that easy. I found it particularly interesting when you discussed the 88 thing, which is, uh, you know that one, Baron. <laughs> how, many keys, how many keys on a piano? Oh, okay. How many Didn't constellations you? are there? Okay. Oh, is there that many? That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. And he also brought up Harry Potter. Uh, Javier brought up Harry, Harry Potter, and that was enjoyable for a lot of kids. I'm sorry, they, I missed that. Uh, how do we reach you on that, uh, Chuck? How, what's, what's your email address? Um, outreach at sbau.org. Okay. And um, it takes a little planning, so it's something people would have to request a little bit ahead of time. Well, there's a lot to talk about and some club news. Uh, I learned about another guy I'd never met, Hank Ailing. 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 Yeah, yeah co commented about uh, our president, Jerry Wilson's home built 12 and a half inch uh, astrograph telescope at CalSTAR, what, several years ago. We chatted about it before we went on the air. You still yeah. have that, right? Oh, yeah, I use that. Oh. Yeah. Well, has Hank ever been to a meeting? Does he come to our first Fridays? when we have them I once know, in a while i think he joined after or no he was there but i didn't know him then okay yeah he 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 he's come to um a couple of meetings um but he, he does a lot of astrophotography off on his own so yeah. he only comes to a meeting if there's something he's really interested in okay now tom whittemore are you still involved yeah. in the tuesday night telescope workshop even though it's online uh, I joined him once, uh, I think two weeks ago, when uh, Bob Richard, when Bob Richard was uh, giving a talk on astrophotography. Okay. So you're well, knocking at my door. I'm I'm online. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this you're not. I get no calls or nobody at the door. But today I have. You're gonna have to wait till I'm done. Come back in half an hour. Okay. Let's go to other things, gentlemen. Shall we? Well, the picture that. Tom has put up now is of me just after I set up my 12 and a half inch F6 Newtonian astrograph at uh, Lake San Antonio where they were holding uh, the fall Cal star that year. I don't remember which year it was, probably 2015 or 2014, something like that. How, well, uh, Jerry, you said that mirror is 12 and a half inches. How, what, the diameter just barely looks like 12 and a half inches there, but it's actually probably 14 inches maybe, huh? It's a 15 inch diameter OD tube, aluminum tube. I had it, uh, I bought it from Parallax Instrument and I wanted it really long. The tube is extra long. Um, it's about a foot longer than you would need because I use it in my backyard and I have to uh, shut out a lot of the neighbor lights. So it, I need that to shade the, the camera down in the farther down the tube. You know, lenses are gone now, aren't they? It's all, it's all at the rear end, it's a mirror, is that? No, no, there are lenses. Matter of fact, the biggest lens ever made was just fabricated for the large synoptic telescope or something. No, no, the Vera Rubin telescope. And that's a mirror, that's a mirror though. No, no, the, there is they put a- it Put in a lens too. Yeah, they, okay. it's a camera lens at the back and it's got the biggest focal plane array that's been made to date. It's a mosaic of focal planes. Okay, but it's not a large lens like the uh, the Yerkes telescope. It's bigger than the Yerkes. Really? It the is actual a, lens? A glass lens, yeah. Wow, okay. He didn't have Whittemore and Tim grind the, uh, le the what, did he grind <laughs> both lenses and mirrors, don't you? Once uh, 
We what? just do mirrors. I just do mirrors. <laughs> Somebody's at my door, but I'm not answering it. I... Going back to the telescope workshops on Tuesday, uh, Tom Whittemore is the person that started these things um, many, many years ago. We used to meet before COVID. We would meet in the Broder building behind the museum every Tuesday night and set up and grind and talk about and test on the different mirrors and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that was before a certain event happened uh, a year ago, almost today. And I guess some of us have been inoculated against this black plague recently or started. Mm -hmm. I have my shots. Okay. Tom, probably you're too young. No, no, no. I, I just got mine Thursday with you. Remember you, you were Thursday, 1130. We drove in there actually early and got the first dose. Oh, okay. I didn't know you were over 65. I got mine on Wednesday, and uh, I arrived maybe seven minutes early, and uh, the whole process uh, took 22 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was very fast. I enjoyed it. I, I didn't feel a thing. I, I had mine on Wednesday. Oh, you did? Beautifully That's... organized, yeah. How about um, your wife, Maureen? She also had hers, yes. So all the wives and the husbands went out there and got in line, and... I, m mine was in my left arm. Hers was in her right arm. Uh, <laughs> so you were driving. I was driving. <laughs> <laughs> well, chances are I'll get my second one before the month of uh, March is out. Three to wow. six weeks, they say. Shall we go to other topics, gentlemen? <clears throat> like, for example, uh, no moon on Thursday uh, as of sunset. Zodiacal light. What is that, Mr. President? That is the sunlight reflecting off of dust outside of Earth's orbit, um, opposite the sun. Wally. It's, it's, um, um, it's shed from various comets doing their thing and get the water off their dust. And so you can see that at sometimes at night. It looks like a false or a second dusk. Wow. I've never heard of it. Sky, as as it, you can see it, the sky seems to brighten a little bit, um, and it, it's limited in space. It doesn't cover the whole sky. It's sort of like a projection up into the sky. Through Aries and Taurus. Yeah. Now along, you're talking, the, along the ecliptic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that, what's that 13th one, the 13th house that has a strange name? Ophiuchus. Starts with o? Ophiuchus. What is it? Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus. Tom, um, I just sent you an email with a picture of the biggest lens. Oh, you did? Yeah, and he put it up briefly. Oh, he did? Yeah. No, that was a mirror. That wasn't it. No, it was a, it was a lens. I, I showed I, the lens. I the, guy was, the guy was standing in front of the lens. Maybe you, you were looking things up while I had it on there. Yeah. Maybe. Show the, the one I sent. It was like six foot in diameter. Let's see. Which, which uh, count did you send it to? Um, says Tom. Okay, oh, says Tom or... Uh, <laughs> I've got 10 different accounts. Let's see. <laughs> and now lenses are sort of out because they have... What? There it is. Okay. We're going to get it up there on the picture of the lens? All right. Just a different picture of it. Yeah, this I is... thought it was all mirrors these days. I'm sorry. Let's see. Share screen. And these guys here kind of laying flat. So is that showing that uh, yep. TP review? Okay. Not not highlighting it. It's not highlighting it for me, so I can't tell what's being shared. Wow. Okay, well, we, we can see it fine. Zoom or scroll down. You can see the whole camera. It's in the LSST, the Large Synoptic, whatever it is. Survey hmm. telescope. If they're too big, they weigh too much, and they get out of alignment, or whatever that word might be. Right? Yeah. You, could, you only support them at the edge, so you have to make it very thick. So it can support itself. Well, my basic understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum, radio waves are on there and optical waves are on there. The color is exact, right. you know. So That's right. Mm -hmm. Infrared is on there, but only the optical uses a lens. Radio would not, you know, a radio telescope like the web would, there's no use of a, of a lens that doesn't yes. do it. You can make lenses for radio waves. Yeah. You can. Yes. Made of glass? No, they're made of, well, they, they, I don't know if they could be made of glass, but generally they're made of other substances. Yeah, usually semiconductors like silicon or germanium. 
Yeah. Really? But they're transparent. Well, like, to, that, to that wavelength, yes. Well, the radio waves go through them just like light waves, but are they changed and redirected and whatever they're, the word they're, is? They're, um, they're focused. Index, their velocity, refractive index bends them to change of refractive the change of refractive index. And refractive index is just the ratio of the speed of light in the material to that outside the material. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the big web is going up uh, if it's on target uh, in the end of October. Oh, welcome back, Whittemore. Oh, hi. I understand how those things work. I got mine ready in case I got to go in there in a minute. <laughs> or unless you're checking sourdough bread in the oven. Uh, incidentally it's awesome bread you gave me thank you, it oh, gave thank me you. One of his load. did you finish it all right <laughs> uh no no i'm going a <laughs> slice a day boy we're getting a lot oh there it is there's the flying dutchman ship yeah. on the horizon uh, i got that from chuck and then i got a version from president jerry and what the heck is that all about it's a uh, well go ahead chuck it's a, it's a superior mirage and so it's uh there's a obviously a, a layer here of um, air at different temperature here, an inversion layer, and it acts like a lens and it bends the light. And so you're actually seeing an image of a ship that's over the horizon. And just this was perfectly placed so that it looks like the ship is floating uh, in the air. It's over the horizon? You wouldn't yeah. normally be able to see it? That's correct. Wow. This inversion layer is acting like a lens and ducting the light. You see that out on our Channel Islands uh, fairly often, uh, really? where they look like they're uh, mushrooms. You know, you see an inverted image, but this one happens to be a non-inverted image. Okay. Yeah, here it's, we go. Here's a good you, explanation. If you're driving down the coast sometimes, you can look out at, I think it's Anacapa Island, and right. it looks like it has super tall cliffs. Um, going down hmm. the waterline. And that's part of this same illusion. It does have cliffs, but not as big as you see them from the, from the beach. So what is that word, the uh, Fata Moranga? I mean, what's- Fata Morgana. 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 It means mirage. Ah, so it's similar to a mirage you'd see on a desert. Yeah. Water in the distance. Mm -hmm. Wow. Is that, is that a Latin term? No, I think it comes from um, King Arthur. Uh, like, um, okay, I'm going to probably screw this all up, but like a, a sorceress. Yeah. Maybe uh, this picture, one. the picture we just saw earlier was taken off the coast of what? <laughs> that was off the coast of, I think, Wales. Wales. Okay, Britain. And uh, the camera sees the same thing as the human eye does. So it's just amazing. Yep. Well, we're back in space again, gentlemen. So um, Comet... Uh, was it Atlas? Get some light on the C2020 is due by Friday, or is it up there now? But you need a telescope, is that right? Um, what more are you? Oop, we lost Losing Ron there. A bit. Or, you... But you're back, mm -hmm. okay? Been a strange morning. This is a number two, it's going into the record books. Whittemore, do you ever look at comets in your uh, telescope? Uh, you, uh, yes. Usually I, I look for the brighter ones. And so I either do a naked eye with curb binoculars. Um, oh, you know, binoculars. Yeah, I mean, there have been some really spectacular ones in the late, uh, late 90s. Um, I even remember uh, during one of the workshops um, on a Tuesday evening, down at the Museum of Natural History, there was one up in the northern sky that we'd see uh, for a few weeks. And Chuck could probably mm -hmm. remember which one that was. It was probably about 2010, Chuck. Comet Holmes, I think, was that one? That sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. It was very it was large and spherical, yeah, it, basically. It was an outburst. Right. And then more recently, there was one in the western sky in the fall. Remember that one, Chuck? Um, Neowise. Yeah, of course, Neowise. Yeah. Back, yeah. back summary. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Where did they get the name Atlas, do you suppose, President Jerry? That's an acronym for the instrument that found it. Yeah. And there was oh, an Atlas last year, too, the 20, 
2020 and then 2021. This is the uh, this is last year's atlas, which you see. Yeah, so there's lots of atlases. Yeah. Are there any other comets that visit us on a regular basis, like Halley's, or is that the only yeah. one? Every 78 oh, no, no. years. There's a well, lot, there's of lot of comets. Oh, there are. Well, I, yeah. I got to tell you, the only one I know about is Halley's. Mm -hmm. I mean, did, is this a regular one that's coming? Has Atlas been here before every 50 years, 100 years? or? Uh, this, the one you're looking at on the screen is the wrong Atlas. That's from last year. But the one from this year is believed to come in from the Oort cloud. So I think it's the first visit though in our history. Wow. And, and from its designation there, it's C slash Atlas which implies that it's probably not periodic, which would have a P slash oh, yeah. atlas or P slash whatever. Mm -hmm. There's uh. a periodic comet called Anka that comes by like every three years, three and a half years. Mm -hmm. Well, now, Oumuamua is not, was not one of those, was it? Mm -hmm. No, no it's... It, it, it's an I for interstellar. Yeah, yeah. And so there was another one that didn't come... What? I didn't get that. I was going to say there was another one discovered that was interstellar too. Um, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, fairly recently. Um, but Oumuamua has, you know, thanks to Avi Loeb, stirred up a lot of dust, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, about what it might be. And he, he, his book is really good. I mean, he's not a nutcase. He's, he's, a, he's a good writer and uh, he's a good scientist. And he just wants us to open our eyes to the possibility that this might be an interstellar traveler. Um, sounds crazy, but you know, reading through the book, you know, I'm not sure he's crazy. So, um, mm. yeah, and, and a lot, lot of his conclusion, you know, he he, he also he dodged a bullet. It didn't come over here. Well, no, we only caught it for 11 days and it was on its way out of the solar system when we caught it. And, and actually a telescope in Hawaii uh, found it. Um, uh, in fact, I think the telescope is called uh, Umuamua, which means scout, something like scout in uh, Hawaiian. It means scout from afar, from afar. So yeah. I, it's not the telescope name, but it is the, uh, uh -huh. the object name. Yeah. Uh, but they think, they think it may be extraterrestrial simply because it there he is. There's, uh, there's, uh, mm -hmm. Ron, it was it was I on a trajectory it. that means it was not bound to the sun, so it had to come from outside the solar system. Right, right. Oh, I see. So it, it, it okay. It became a parabola or something on its hyperbola. Hyperbola. Yeah. You know, a lot, of, a lot of the book, by the way, is devoted to his life. Uh, he's he's in his late fifties now. A uh, fascinating guy. His. Um, grandparents survived uh you know the Hol holocaust and he was actually raised in israel uh, in in a little village oh. called beit hanan and they grew all kinds you know of fruit and things like that and a, a lot a lot of book really captures your heart because of the things he talks about his youth and being in a small community you know and now you know being discovered and finally become the chairman of uh, Harvard's, uh, you know, really good astronomy department. I don't think he is any longer the head. Okay, I think he uh, he does a lot of other things too in conjunction with, you know, Chuck would know a lot about, you know, the or Jerry about the um, oh these little postage st uh, stamp size things going to Proxima Centauri B. Uh, so he's involved in that. Uh, I know he knows Phil Lubin at the university. Because Phil's involved in some of those those searches. Mm -hmm. Hmm. But given what we know about the distance between stars, if that were some sort of intelligence, wouldn't it have made some arrangements to stay here instead of taking off? Well, you know, you know, again, the, uh, Avi talks about you know what would it might be to encounter you know this civilization. You know, how old are they? You know. Um, I mean, if this really is a sailcraft, it must have come from a fairly advanced civilization to produce this. God knows from where, you know. Well, yeah. actually, they trace the uh, trajectory back, and it's, it's like seven light years away. There's a Gliese red uh -huh. dwarf star that uh, this may have originated near. I see. But they were 
they were postulating that it was a fragment of an ass elongated fragment of an asteroid that was tossed out of that system. So who okay. knows? Yeah, there's a lot, obviously there's a lot of controversy. Um, yeah. but it's, it's just fascinating way to look at things. Um, you know, he even talks about the Drake equation and how focused that is on yeah. communication through radio and how now we should be looking uh, OSETI, optical SETI, looking for laser pulses. Um, or even pollution since our, you know, way we see things with our telescopes now is so detailed. Um, you could, you might be able to see pollution from stellar systems that might be created by, you know, other civilizations around these stars. You know, he's got all kinds of stuff on the table, I admit. And it's just interesting. It's, it makes very interesting reading. I'll tell you that. Do you happen to know what the other visitor was? It was uh, a comet. No, no, the, the other that they think was... It, it was a comet. Okay. Oh, it was a comet? Yeah. And it was the Russian guy, the, the Ukrainian... Um, oh, that's right. I remember. Crimea that has a, uh, a okay. telescope that found it. And I can't remember the telescope name. Okay. Because the, the Oort cloud is not on the ecliptic alone. It's the, a shell, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It's as far out from the sun over and above the sun as it is out on the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case of Oumuamua, the proposed method of propulsion on this is that it's a solar sail. And yeah. So, and again, what you're seeing, don't forget, is, is an artist's rendition of what they think it might have right. looked like. And this, There's no the picture. Artist's renditions tend to favor it being a long cylindrical thing, but it could be a flat disk. Yes, yes. So, and, and, and that, that would be the solar that's sail. Apparent. That's apparent in what's being displayed now, that it could be a flat disk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> UFO, huh? And the only reason it didn't have a tail like a comet is there's no water on board? Now, that's not a UFO. We know what that is. We've even got unfuzzy pictures of it. Well, we got radar images of it. I just wonder how they locked onto it. You can't just... Point your telescope well, at it. We have, all these, no, we have all these surveys up there looking for yeah. things that move. And if you oh, see that, right? that moves, they focus on it. Take data. Let's go back to the up where the winter sky has <laughs> okay. Let me do a quick promo here for you, gentlemen. A reminder okay. that the SPAU video audio podcast is done every Monday morning at 11 a.m. And we've seen at our SB Astronomical Unit YouTube channel. In fact, we may be on live right now. I'm not sure. Tom told us we might be. Link is on our main webpage, everybody, sbau.org. Tell your stargazing friends, and we could always use new members. We're chomping at the bit to go back on a Friday night to Farron Hall, aren't we? It'll be, what, six, yeah. seven, eight months, perhaps, I have Mr. No President? Idea. You have yeah, no idea? No. Some people are speculating that COVID may never go away. It might just be with us for a while because of the rate at which it's evolving. And um, the, uh, so that we will have to get a shot for COVID every year, just like we get a flu shot every year because the flu evolves into a new disease every year. And yes, so yes. they have to do that just like uh, flu shots. Well, they've been predicting for years that uh, sooner or later variants are going to take over and they, they'll be totally immune to... It could take over, but... Antibiotics? This could be the beginning of the end, gentlemen. Antibiotics don't work against viruses. We will live on screen from, from now on. We'll never see each other. Just oh. hey, let, me, let me interject a, a, pl a plug for Javier's article at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History in their blog that he did on uh, an asteroid chaos. Uh, I can't pronounce it, Aprophos, Aprophos? Uh, Read that. And uh, just a Aprophos. picture. So he's got this nice blog covering the Aprophos and also on the uh, Mars Perseverance, uh, the, the helicopter. So I'm, so I'm sorry, I'm moving along too quick. It probably doesn't come out very well. And so it's a great, great little blog article. I hope people can catch. I'll put a link to it in the, in the comments for this video. And there's Javier inside the Museum of Natural History's observatory there with the 20 inch, I think 20 inch telescope and a six inch solar and a six inch refractor there donated by Wayne Rosing of the Las Cumbres Observatory. Oh, okay. 
and he hung it up just because the pandemic or was he set to retire anyway? Uh, something that he just did, a nice little article he did in February after, after he retired. So kind of uh, February 25th, it came out. Have you noticed how many coaches and teachers and our police chief are just going away because of the pandemic, giving up and running? Oh, yeah. Let's wait. Let me go back a second. Uh, it's Apophis. Apophis. Uh, Apophis. Apophis. And it's a um, Egyptian god of destruction or death or something like that. Chaos. <laughs> Chaos. Yeah. Well, is it going by the earth? Uh, it's it's um, going by the earth. Yes. Oh my God! Hopefully that's forever. It's the one that if it went by in 2029 in a certain distance, then we would be in trouble at some several three three or four decades uh beyond that but the chances are extremely low that it's gonna hit the earth and javier's article says it'll pass within about twenty thousand miles of earth in 2029 what yeah. maybe that's and that's within the uh geosynchronous satellite band so interesting isn't there one going by the moon or actually a million miles out four times uh, the distance of the moon? Yeah, four or five times the, the distance to the moon. I forget the name of that one. We talked I reckon, about it last week, I think. I recommend oh, people go to spaceweather.com to see the list of uh, uh, asteroids passing by. It's a great, great place to see what uh, who's, who's coming close. Speaking of asteroids, um, you occult still in the middle of the night, do you not, Chuck? When it's clear. All right, you got <laughs> Tell us what when it's clear. Oh, it hasn't been clear lately. Well, there's there's uh, two coming up in the next or three occultations coming up on Tuesday night, Wednesday. That looks like it's going to be clouded out. Okay. You know what I can't understand? Uh, we can find a little rock a mile or less across. Yeah. And lock in on it and let it obliterate a star, but we can't find that Planet X. Which is going to be um, Planet X? Might you know there are some conditions on Planet X. First of all, there's a new paper out where a research group <clears throat> has re-examined the data from a Planet X, and they said that there's no real selective lineup of the uh, orbits like that. It kind of goes away. It's just the group effect of the uh, um, Kep Kep outer planets, the belt out there, the Kuiper belt, and the other thing. Oh, okay. The other thing is it could be a black hole. Um, if it's a black hole, it's about the size of a baseball, and you ain't never going to find that. Well, how many suns? It's several suns in, in no, weight. It's about, it's about the mass of, I think, 20 Earths or something. Yeah. Uh, really? Five, five to 10 Earth masses, I think. Okay, that's it, yeah. Wow. So, that's, <clears throat> Jerry, would, would you notice uh, stars, light from stars being deflected by the black hole passing in front of them? That's, that's a very small deflection to see. Um, you wouldn't, you, even if the baseball were just a normal thing illuminated by the sun, you wouldn't find it. So well, what, would it be a danger in space travel in the future if we got near it? You can get, you can get a few seconds of an arc deflection of stars by the mass of the sun, but by this mass of 10 Earths, you wouldn't see any deflection, no. Wow. Let's look at the, Chuck, can you, or people, can you go down to the um, three pictures of the uh, Perseus landing on Mars? Perseverance. Pretty really cool things. Yep, NASA on Mars. Three countries are at Mars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I got that uh, somewhere. Yeah. That's more than three. Yeah, I. So the first one uh, from the high rise camera on the MRO, it actually shows the rover on the surface and it shows the ground next to it that has been blown away by the landing jets of the sky crane. We're looking down from above from an orbit. Yeah, you're looking straight down from about 160 yeah. kilometers up uh, wow. in orbit around Mars. What happened there? Well, the high rise. There was another one from the Exo Mars too that showed that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So you can see that detail. I guess Chuck's having or Tom's having technical issues here. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. I'll get there. I'll get there. Here, okay. here it comes. There wow. you go. Look at that. Not, not that one. The uh, two above it. 
two two other ones. Yeah. But you can see it in. Yeah, there. Yeah, see, here the, we are. The, the center rectangle, the white rectangle, that's the Perseverance rover. Oh my and God. The white stuff is the surface uh, dust freshened up by the rocket exhaust. And Chuck's right, you can see that, uh, not centered, uh, but see it in the final picture. If you move down one more, you can see the parachute laying on the ground and the heat shield next to it. Wow. That's amazing <laughs> resolution because that parachute is like 80 feet across. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the yellow on the screen? Yeah. Yeah, the yellow and white thing. That's the parachute all rumpled up on the surface. And the pattern of the markings on the parachute is like a UPC code that says, says dare great things. That's their motto for this mission. Oh, wow. Okay, this orbiter that took Wait, the picture. Uh, one, more, one more picture down. Is, is it, uh, did it come with this, uh, with the Perseverance, the orbiter yeah. that took? It no, did. This orbiter was put up in 2005. It's meant oh. to be a relay satellite for all missions to Mars. Okay, so and it's. We're getting a lot of our data through it. Have we seen pictures of other landers, other rovers yes. from above? <clears throat> yes, they do. And several of them are in flight landing. Two pre right. two one, this one and one previous one I can recall. This okay. one shows the parachute and the back shell way over on the left. Okay. <laughs> it shows the descent stage and its streak where it hit the ground and splattered. Because remember when you, um, and then here, Perseverance, this is where it shows the uh, two bright dots where the rocket motor distributed solar or uh, Earth, or not Earth, Mars surface. And then okay. the heat shield is laying down over on the far right. And so that's, that's where it's all happening. That's downtown on Mars. <laughs> but it's supposed to be sitting inside a huge crater. I don't really <laughs> see it. It's downtown on Mars. Well, the, the crater is the size of Lake Tahoe, Ron. So it's 28 miles across. And this is just a tiny little area here. From the, from the back shell to the Perseverance is probably a mile or a mile and a half. And that crater used to be full of water like Tahoe? Yep. Was it liquid, you suppose? Yeah, yeah. Yes. OK. Well, they're, they're looking at frozen ones on the bottom of the moon, and they're going to try to check those out soon, but that's a different topic. And, and there are frozen ones we've seen on Mars, too. We've seen them? Yeah. Yes. There's a picture of one that's got water ice in it. OK. Are they on the poles like they think on the moon? Yeah, they're closer to the poles. Really? Because the sun hitting them on the side of the planet would, what, evaporate them or? Sublime them. Sublime yeah, them. Sublimate. <laughs> yeah. I would imagine water would exist as ice all over Mars, wouldn't it? That ever higher than the soil. It what? may. It may be just a few inches under underground. Wow. Well, when's the ingenuity uh, <coughs> going to take off? The little two rotor helicopter. Do we know? They're going to they're going to move Perseverance to a flatter area first before they try that. It's currently kind of papoosed under the uh, rover. So they're going to move to a flatter area, and then they're going to drop it off and move away from it and do their first flight. But that's going to be days, if, if not a month. Uh, Mr. President, did you send out a picture taken by Perseverance, something that looked like a, a large mesa in Arizona, but it was on Mars? Yeah. yeah. Is that the side of the crater, the wall? No, that's, a, that's just a mesa in the crater. God, it was it's huge. The delta where the water, where they could see water was running into the crater and depositing sediments. Well, can I present a little quandary in my brain about um, microbes found on Mars? How in the world do we know if we found something in the dirt on Mars that it didn't get brought there by perseverance? Well, I guess you don't. We they, dis <laughs> they disinfected perseverance. Yeah. Totally. Can, can that be done? It can, and it, it um, people do it. We disinfect everything that goes out, but you never know if you get everything. The they have found um, bacteria growing on the outside of the ISS. Wow. <laughs> that was believed to have um, come from um, the Earth. Are you and talking about are talking about those? Are you talking about those water bears? Water bears, water graves. No, that's, that's an intended passenger for the interstellar, our first interstellar shot. 
Wow. And speaking of which, um, what was the name of the guy that, Tom, you said you knew it, or the guy that um, Bobby Lowe knew at UCSB? Oh, uh, uh, Phil Lubin. Phil Lubin. Yeah, Phil Lubin. Mm -hmm. Phil Lubin is collaborating. He has the most interesting um, yeah. um, in, um, group at UCSB. It's called Experimental Cosmology. And of course, astronomy is famous for, you know, you can't set up an experiment and see how it works. So he's the first one to add a, a experimental to, to outer space or astrophysics. But he's got this plan with a Russian supporter to send postage stamp size spaceships, cameras, camera systems. Right. Sent by uh, laser light um, to All the, way to the Centauri system at near the set, you know, a significant fraction of the speed of light and tardigrades are considered for possible passengers because they're so rugged against outer space. But once it gets there, we're not going to see anything for four years, right? We're probably going to get a cease and desist letter from sending home. <laughs> <to the planet. laughs> I think we're close to the end of our second edition, gentlemen. Anything you want to say, Tom Whittemore? Uh, no, this is just wonderful. Uh, this is the first first one I have participated in. It's just really nice. Uh, and thank Tom Totten for you know getting it going and yeah. everybody yeah. involved. Well, you do a great newsletter, my friend. And if anybody oh, wants to, to join the club, they'll get it online, I guess. How many do you send out every month? Uh, I, okay, uh, I, I send it to Chuck, and then Chuck proofreads it, and then it goes through uh, Colin, Colin uh, Taylor. So um, right now, of course, we're only doing electronic, oh. right? electronic. So um, I don't know how many you know club members received the electronic version. Colin uh, used to mail and email it, and there were what? maybe ten or fifteen people I think that got it by a snail mail. Mm -hmm. and, um, probably, you know, something less than a hundred that get it by email. Yeah. And since he's our treasurer, I guess he's keeping our money under wraps. So I haven't heard much lately. I guess everything's, everything's yeah. fine. He suspended all, you know, dues and things like that until sure. this. Oh, has he? All right. Well, yeah. I, I hope we can all see each other again someday. In the meantime, it's interesting looking at our ugly mugs on screen. Thank you. <laughs> I look forward to getting a haircut. <laughs> yeah. I shaved my beard a little bit. I trimmed it just for this this wow. morning. Okay. Gentlemen, we'll see you next week on Monday morning, 11 o'clock. We'll find out if we broadcast on YouTube. And Tom Totten, take care of yourself. Uh, give my love to your wives. And thank All you. All right. Thanks, Thanks very much, Baron. Good program. See you. Thanks, Tom. See you on YouTube.